again and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your host, certified sex therapist Lori Watson, author of Wanting Sex Again and blogger at Psychology Today and WebMD. And I have with me Dr. Adam Matthews, my co-host, who's a couples therapist, psychotherapist, and president of NCAMFT. Foreplay is dedicated to helping couples keep it hot. Each episode, we cover an aspect of sex that impacts your sex life and something that you can relate to. So if you find our discussions helpful, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. We would love it if you would tell a friend about us. You can find us also on the web at foreplayrst.com. And if you have a comment or a topic that you'd like us to talk about, we'd love to hear from you. Please send them to us at info at foreplayrst.com. Thanks for listening. Now on to today's topic. Hey, in this episode, I am going to give the sexual pursuer the rescue plan. How to stop sexually pursuing in a way that drives your partner away. Uh, You've just got me today. Dr. Adam Matthews is out and about. He's on vacation with his family and his lovely wife. And so it's just me. And I thought about somebody, a patient that I had recently, who I called and I asked him permission. You know, what he said was so typical to what happens in the bedroom. He's the sexual pursuer and what he goes through mentally that I thought, oh my gosh, I have to put this on the podcast. I really have to share this. And the irony is there's going to be several people out there who see me who think it's them and it's not. So if I didn't ask you permission, I'm not talking about you, (laughs) but I am talking about this one man who represented so many sexual pursuers. And a sexual pursuer can certainly be female. I have lots of women out there who come to see me and say, you know, they're the ones who want sex more often, who want sex more intensely, and who, who really are frustrated in the bedroom. But sometimes the sexual pursuer basically ends up doing something that sabotages sex. And that's what I want to talk to you about is what is the sabotage? What's going on in the sexual pursuer's mind? And how do you stop doing that so that you don't drive your partner away? Okay, so this guy, he was telling me and he says, you know, and this is, you know, he's over 40. So he starts out with an erection and this is good news, right? You know, okay, he's really aroused. He's really excited by his wife, who he says is beautiful. And he's turned on by her. And they start fooling around. They start love play or heavy petting or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, he is into it. But suddenly he starts thinking, And the thinking is, goes like this, you know, am I pleasing her? Do you think she's disappointed in me? And, and this is really early on, maybe, you know, 10 minutes in or so. And he starts this self doubt. So first he's, he's worried about, you know, am I doing it right? Um, Because his wife doesn't reach orgasm very easily. And so he has a lot of doubt about that. And she's not a very verbal person. So he doesn't exactly know what he's doing and if it's working. But I know because I've talked to her, too, that he does please her and it's fine. And it's kind of this brain noodling stuff that he does that really destroys them. But so he starts to think a little bit and it turns out they're in the dark. And this guy, as I know, it's stereotypical, but many men, right, you know, like to watch, like to see his partner Um, But this man in particular also likes eye-to-eye contact. I mean, that is super intimate for him. And he starts getting disappointed uh, because he's like, oh, you know, my wife, she really likes it in the dark. And I said, well, you know, does she have body self-consciousness? And he said, no, not really. It's just that being in the dark for her is her mode. You know, she is a sensual mode person. We've talked about this. And she likes kind of sensation. She likes to be immersed in it. She likes the the touch and the feeling. Whereas for him, he likes visual, he likes to see her. And so during this experience, he starts to fantasize a little bit. And then he's like, oh my gosh, you know, what's the use of this? You know, I could be, I don't want to be fantasizing about somebody else. I want to be with my partner and with my spouse. And then he starts to feel guilty about that. He's like, I'm, you know, I'm guilty because I'm fantasizing and then I'm not really with her. 
And he says, you know, and I need that contact. I want that contact. And he kind of kids and he says, you know, if I wanted to be by myself, I'm really good by myself. I'm really good at it. You know, but I really wanted to be with her and I wanted this experience. Okay, so think about this. They're they're into it maybe 20 minutes by this point. And he says he starts to feel his erection wane. And I would say most guys who are over 40 are going to have their erections wane if they're making love for 20 minutes. I mean, that's normal. That's normal. And, you know, but he starts to worry about it, right? He's like, you know, it's not what it was. And this guy is, I think, well over 40. But he starts to worry about it because he's like, this is not how it should be. Okay, another stream of thought comes into his head. So first he's anxious about what he's doing. Now he's starting to be anxious about his own responsiveness. She doesn't seem to be getting anywhere, but they're going along just fine. But she doesn't say anything about it. She doesn't give him any verbal feedback. And the more and more he thinks about it, he's saying, you know, I can't see my wife if only, this is a killer, right? If only X. Once a sexual pursuer starts in their mind down that path, if only this were happening, if only that were happening, if only we could do this, if only we could do that, they leave their body. They're no longer feeling It's very hard to keep arousal. It's very hard to enjoy the experience when we're in our heads comparing, when we're spectering, when we're watching ourselves really do make love. We're above the bed and we're not in the moment with our partner. So pretty soon it's not just critical about himself, but he starts to feel a little critical about her and angry. It's just too anonymous, he's telling himself. You know, I'm not you know, I'm not really here with her. She's not really here with me. How does she know it's me? His worries mount. Now it's been maybe 30, 40 minutes. His erection is over, as as I would expect, right? I mean, I think with that kind of time, most men are not going to keep their erection. That's normal. Uh, But he says, um, this other voice kind of creeps in and he says, but we're not going to do it for a month. And the joke he made to me was, you know, if you go to the fair, and our state fair is coming up here in October, yay, yay, Raleigh friends, I know you'll go there too, but he says, if you go to the fair only once a year, you know, you expect cotton candy and you want to ride the Ferris wheel. And this guy is like, we're not riding the Ferris wheel, we're not eating cotton candy, this is, you know, we're just walking around the fair, and it's not fun. So he's analyzing. He's starting to judge. He's comparing this moment with many moments, with the moment that used to be, the moment that was with his first girlfriend who was multi-orgasmic six ways to Sunday, the moment that should be with his wife. And all of this is going through his head. And eventually, you know, he starts to withdraw from the experience. He starts to criticize her, at least at this point, not out loud, thank goodness. But in his mind, he's criticizing her. And he's saying, you know, you are not a fun partner. You do not want to ride the Ferris wheel. You don't want to eat any cotton candy. It's no fun to go to the fair with you. And this once a year opportunity is really, really frustrating. Now, all of you out there who are sexual pursuers, I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, my gosh, this is exactly what I go through. I mean, even if you're a woman, even though I described it from a male perspective, I'm sure there are times that, you know, you want to come up behind your partner, touch him and get a hit, you know, a a real excited hit in terms of, you know, you made contact. And I think that's what sexual pursuers want. They want to zing right when they're there, and they want it to be high intensity. I want to help you with this because the point of any sexual encounter is to build on eroticism. We want to build from that moment to a better moment down the road or at least more moments down the road because, as you can imagine, by the time this sexual experience is over, he's withdrawn, he's disappointed, She actually was having a good time, didn't know all this that was going on in his head until he stopped being as enthusiastic, stopped touching her in the same way, 
And then essentially he ruins it for her because she can't enjoy the good feeling that she had. For her, she was like, you know, it was good. I liked it. I liked walking around the fair. But what I don't like is a partner who's angry, who's wanting to talk about it in bed, who's wanting to say, you know, why didn't we have any cotton candy? That's the last time we're going to the fair together and is upset by the whole thing. And she feels blindsided. The intensity oftentimes of a sexual distancer's experience. Remember, sexual distancers like sex. They often like it. It's like, what the heck just happened? You know, I had no idea your mind was going a million miles an hour. And I didn't know how to correct that. You didn't give me any clue. You didn't sort of help steer this thing in a way that might have gone a little bit better. Or, you know, you're not relaxed. They feel the tension. They feel the anger. And then guess what happens? You're right. They don't want to go to the fair anymore. They're like, you're so disappointed that we went there and we... You know, didn't do everything that you wanted to do, and now you're angry at me, and you tell me now, you know, to me, going to the fair was going to the Ferris wheel, and we didn't do that, and I'm so pissed off at you that the sexual withdrawal is kind of shut down. Okay, sexual pursuers out there, let's come back after this little break and talk about what you're going to do about it, how you can manage this better and how you can keep your sexual distancing partner, you know, wanting to go to the fair with you, wanting to try the Ferris wheel, wanting to try cotton candy without throwing up on you. You're listening to 4Play Radio Sex Therapy. I am your sex therapist, Lori Watson, and I will be right back. Wanting sex again. How to Rediscover Desire and Heal a Sexless Marriage by Certified Sex Therapist Lori Watson. Each chapter is designed to fix one of the problems that cause low libido from early marriage through the childbearing years, even all the way through menopause. I've also had men read it and tell me that for them it was the most hopeful thing they read about resolving sexual problems. Look for Wanting Sex Again on Amazon.com. You can also talk to Lori Watson for therapy in person or via Skype. I offer couples counseling and sex therapy and I think about both aspects of the relationship, emotional intimacy and sexual technique and that combination together helps marriages be happy. Improve your sex and improve your relationship with Awakening Center for Couples and Intimacy. Find out more at awakenloveandsex.com. Awaken what's possible. It is one of my great joys in life to be able to really help individuals and couples find strength in their relationships and really find hope again. Licensed marriage and family therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews from Matthews Counseling. I work with a wide variety of issues, including depression and anxiety, marital issues, issues with adolescence. I believe that therapy should be designed around you, that it should be personalized to who you are and to your unique situation. Therapy is available in office, online, and by phone. I want therapy to be comfortable for everyone. At our office, you'll find that we sit around a fireplace in deep, comfortable chairs, look at the problem differently, and offer practical solutions for you to take home and utilize outside of the therapy room. Schedule today and rediscover hope. You can find me on the web at matthewscounseling.net. Matthews with one T. You can contact us through email or phone and find a lot of resources on our website, matthewscounseling.net. I'm back with Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. This is Lori Watson, your sex therapist, and Dr. Adam Matthews is on vacation. So it's just me today, and we are talking about how to fix the sexual pursuit that drives your partner away. First of all, as we just talked about, the sexual pursuer's mind is really, really busy. I mean, they are everywhere but the bed. They are in the future. They are in the past. They are comparing. They are judging. They are critical of themselves, their partner, worried about their functioning. I mean, their mind is just full of all kinds of things except for eroticism. 
So the first thing I would have you do is, first of all, once you go to the fair, which I realize there's all kinds of things about getting to the fair and getting your partner to agree to go to the fair, but let's say you're at the fair. I mean, first of all, you kind of have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy the scenery. You have to enjoy the walkabout. Lay aside some of your expectations. Just say, you know what? It's good to be in the dark. It's good to be touching. Skin on skin feels good. Try to take a deep breath and be in the moment. I mean, one of the things about sexually distancing people is often they're really not judging the experience. They're not judging you. They're not rating it. They are very present to the moment. Uh, when you say, was that good? They say, yeah, that, w- that was great for me. And you're, so, and you're like, well, you know, it wasn't nearly as powerful as the time, you know, when we did it six weeks ago. And they're like, uh, they don't even think like that. And so I'm coaching you, stop some of the comparison. Stop being anywhere else but the bed. Become centered in the moment. So how do you do that, right? How do you do that when... You know, you're so anxious. First thing is take a deep breath. Seriously, let's take a deep breath. (sighs) Take a deep breath and come into your body. What does your body feel? Is it nice to be skin on skin? Is your partner's body warm? Do you feel hot and bothered? Isn't that a great feeling to be aroused? What is the sensation right now? And not necessarily what could make the sensation better. In some ways, your creativity can happen at another time. In the moment, you just kind of have to go for it. You know, remember that great movie scene with Ghost with Demi Moore and the ghost is behind her and they're forming this pot, you know, and she's at the potter's wheel and he's got his arms around her and it's slippery and slidey and she's got her eyes closed I mean, that's what you got to do. You got to sort of be in the moment, not necessarily thinking about any other place, but just what are you feeling? What's slippery and slidey right now? See if you can practice that. One, One way that is really effective for sex and for just about any other kind of anxiety issue is meditation. And what you do when you meditate is focus on your breath, just in, out, in, out, and sort of, the, you got it. You you get where I'm going here, but I'm really talking about breath for a minute. Uh, focus on breathing in and breathing out, and don't think about anything else. And I challenge you pursuers out there, do this for one minute. You know, just sit somewhere all by yourself every day. When you park your car at work, take one minute and practice thinking of nothing else but breathing. Don't don't adjust your breathing. Just notice your breathing for a whole minute. On an iPhone, you can say, you know, Siri, set my alarm for one more minute, and and it'll happen. And then and then you're done, and you go into work, and you've learned to clear your mind. And it's that practice of becoming present to the very moment that you're in that makes you a much more attuned lover. So. You know, this guy is thinking, my erection is what makes me a great lover. And I would tell you, every woman that I know says, actually, how you touch, how you deliver oral sex, how attuned you are to me is what makes a great lover. And I would say, you know, as a woman, right, that's what makes a man a great lover. And as a man, I would say a woman who tunes in to her lover's movements, and his body and becomes present to him and can focus on him, that's that's being a great lover. It's not really performance. It's not really erections. Oh my gosh, it's not erections. So many women would say that, you know, that if you lose your erection, you know, you can still make love, right? It's all about touch. So guys, get over it that it's, you think it's about your erection. It's not. It's totally not. So please try to relax in this. Okay, so part two would be, I want you to be quiet after the event is over. And that means get out of bed with a smile. Say, that was great, honey. That was awesome. Thank you so much for being with me. I love being with you. And just absolutely, positively button it. No criticism when you're in bed. Never. 
I, I mean, never. You don't criticize the cooking at the table. Like, never criticize the moment when you're getting out of bed. Likewise, don't ask your partner in that moment, what would have made it better for you? I, I know, I know, because I'm a sexual pursuer. I get it. You know, I, I know how much that curiosity is, like, so present for you, and you want to know, and you want to, like, you know, understand your partner better. But you know what partners feel about that? Sexual distancers feel criticized. What? It wasn't good enough? What just happened wasn't good enough? And so they feel like they didn't perform. They feel like they didn't get the gold star. They feel like somehow or another they've disappointed you. And so what you got to do is just keep it buttoned. Get out of bed, smile, say something positive. I don't care if it's the worst sex of your life. You know, just keep it buttoned, smile and get out of bed and go about your day or roll over, go to sleep, pull your partner to you and say, that was great, loved being with you. And I say that, you know, whether somebody came or didn't, whether you had orgasms or not, whether your partner got there or not, unless your partner is wanting more, in which case you should deliver, you know, then enjoy what was. And and why do you do this? Like you think, Lori, we're never going to get any better. It's never going to get there. I'm never going to get to the Ferris wheel or I'm never going to, you know, get any cotton candy. Well, I think the thing is, is that there's something between non-pathological people, people generally who love each other, who want to please each other, even if they're caught in the power struggle. I mean, by and large, we want to be happy and we want our partner to be happy. We want to make them happy. We wish they were happy with us, right? So by and large, if you set up for a sexual distance or safety that, you know what, they're great lovers, that you give them encouragement in realistic doses, you know, maybe you find something positive to say, not a whole review, because sexual distancers, once the window closes, they feel modest again. So you don't want to bring it up in an inopportune time like the breakfast table in front of the children. A lot of sexual distancers, I'm telling you, that is not the time for review uh, because they feel embarrassed about their lack of inhibition and their freedom in bed. And you may be delighted in it. I get that. But they're anxious again and they're modest again. So respect that. Maybe a wink and a nod or a squeeze on the shoulder and a kiss on the neck and say, I love you. That's encouragement. And Sexual distancers, in order to become their best uninhibited self, need a sense of safety. I can't emphasize that enough. They need a sense of approval. Like every incremental change is something to be excited about. You know, when you're training a puppy, right, every time they approximate the behavior that you want, you're like shouting and happy and treating and and really and truly Maybe that's that's too base or too, you know, something that doesn't make sense. But what I'm saying is that we respond to positive affirmation. And this is one place more than anything in the world. Sex needs positive affirmation. I, I mean, I've talked to so many women who tell me, well, my husband, you know, he lost his erection and I, I got really angry. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're kidding. You, you know, they're sexual pursuers, female sexual pursuers. I'm like, you got angry? Because your partner lost his erection? What in the world were you thinking? Because I guarantee you that will make him lose his erection again. And she's like, yeah, but, you know, he's, he just like withdraws. I'm like, okay, then frame it that way. Like maybe later on in a discussion over coffee, say, you know what, honey, when you lose your erection, it's okay because we can still hold each other. You can still give me an orgasm. It's okay. I'm open to any kind of orgasm. That's fine. You know, like encourage him. Don't criticize him because usually men withdraw because they feel anxious, embarrassed, and humiliated when they lose their erection. So if you're a female pursuer, try to find a kind way to draw him back in. Because I I would say never, ever, ever criticize that because you will just create an anxiety that never stops, that causes, you know, nearly permanent ED. So so don't go there. And I think the same thing happens with a man who asks his wife, you know, or his girlfriend, you know, did you, did you have an orgasm? Did you come? It's like, 
first of all, I, I hope that she can feel relaxed enough to let you know that she did. I mean, that's that's what you're going for, right? A woman who can let you know that she did and that she was pleased herself. And if you don't know, you know, you've got a lot of work ahead of you to make her feel safe enough, safe enough to be expressive, safe enough to tell you. But it's not something that you want to ask and you don't want to ask it in the moment. Like, was it good for you? Just it's a bad question. Just say it was good for me. Okay, so sexual pursuers, I understand your mind is very busy. You got to come into the moment, feel your own body, let the slippery, slidey fun be a pleasure to you. Focus on your breathing. If you start doing that, you know, comparison with the future or with the past or whatever, when you stop the sexual moment, when it's over, all you're offering is positive reinforcement that you were glad and grateful for the experience. You're shutting your mouth, you're buttoning up, and only offering your partner a sense of safety and delight that they consented to go to the fair with you, and it doesn't matter if you didn't have cotton candy and the Ferris wheel. I'm not saying that we can never, ever talk about that, but I'm saying when you have ended a sexual encounter, that is not the time to talk about it. This is the time to build in your partner a sense that it was a great experience. Okay, please, I hope you've got it. This has been fun. I I could talk. I could just talk by myself. My gosh. I mean, it's like our time is up. But you're listening to Lori Watson, sex therapist with Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy, and it's been a delight to be with you today. Sexual pursuers, hang in there. Hey, help us stay on top here at Foreplay. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much.